folks. Happy Earth Day, so to speak. Um, welcome to the Climate Change Cafe. My name is Tim Stevenson. I'm a community organizer and founding director of Post Oil. Um, next month's Climate Change Cafe will be on the fourth Tuesday, which is May 27th. We are going to show a film. Um, it's a little under an hour, about a 55-minute film called The Wisdom to Survive, Climate Change, Capitalism, and Community. And uh, we're going to start earlier. We're going to start at 6 o'clock uh, because what we want to do is to have a working session after that. And what that means is really um, talking about what we can do um, around climate change, both in terms of adaptation and in terms of um, uh, mitigation resistance uh, to big oil. So um, I encourage you all to come. I'm going to send. I'll send this around for you to jot this down in your your uh, your electronic gadgets, uh, which all of you have. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about a lot next. Um, uh, next uh, in our session in, uh, in May is this growing collaboration that we've established with the, uh, the greater arts community in this town. Um, as you know, the, the cafe is about um, trying to find uh, more creative and imaginative ways to engage a public that is largely unengaged while knowledgeable about and increasingly accepting, yet um, as polls indicate, it's, it's not high on the list of, of, of uh, most people. So one of the initiatives that we have made is, with the, as I said, with the arts community. And um, that includes um, an art show that it looks like we're going to have um, with artists uh, doing um, uh, paintings uh, about uh, climate change, uh, ranging from how they feel about it, the, their emotional state about this, ranging to what people can do and things like that. We're also in the process of negotiating with the town the possibility of putting banners up, which has never been done. There are a number of polls that are owned by the town and not by Green Mountain Power, which is the majority of the polls on, say, Main Street, for example, um, that the town has never used but would consider that. And we're going, we're in, a, in fact, we have a meeting this coming Friday with, with uh, folks about that. Don't know whether it'll succeed, but it's another example of where we're trying to bring climate change, as I like to say, out of the closet. Uh, make it more of a presence where people are running into this notion that it's here and it's now. Um, so we'll be talking about that and other things that we're doing. Tonight, what I'd like to do before uh, we get into to the, the main program is um, to call upon May Quilty, who is a student at SIT has been very active around this issue, at least during the short time I've known her, um, and is responsible for starting a, uh, a very uh, strong divestment movement on the SIT campus that has uh, um, got the uh, uh, support, strong support, not only of the student body, but of the faculty and the administration. And she will tell you uh, more about what's, how, that how that project is developing and where it will go in the very near future. So May? Um, so I'm May, I'm a student at SIT. And before I say anything, I just want to say for people who were here last week, there was a larger group of us. Um, we didn't lose momentum, they're just on a field trip in Montpelier, most of them. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on for Earth Day. Um, and Caitlin's also here from SIT. And so we're working on divestment on the campus, but we're also focused on other sustainability initiatives. And so we're kind of looking into who we need to contact for that. Um, we met with the marketing department this morning about kind of strengthening our argument when we go into meeting with the board about how it could really be a positive thing for the school. Um, the faculty assembly officially endorsed us last week, so we have a letter of endorsement going into our board <coughs> meeting. Um, we met with a few different staff members. We've met with a lot of students. We're gathering um, signatures on our petition, reaching out to alumni. This Saturday, we have the Race for the Reason at SAT, which is benefiting Food Connects, which um, a lot of you are probably familiar with. So if people want to be a part of that, we're also going to have a divestment table there and have a few surprise actions um, around that. They were kind of just trying to publicize it and get the community involved. But we have, basically for moving forward, we're only here for another month as the student body, a lot of you know. 
Um, so we had a great panel last night that Tim was a part of, and the issue kind of came up of sustainability for the organization and really what happens if we don't get divestment approved this semester, kind of going forward and really making sure that next semester and for many semesters moving forward, we're gonna have a momentum on campus for sustainability. Um, so we're working on that, but we basically have on May 6th, two of the board members are coming to us. We were originally gonna go to New York City, um, and they're the two that kind of have the power to make the decision on divestment. Um, so we're hoping that goes well. We'll update everyone on that. Um, and we also have a meeting with the provost. We've met with him once before, and we're trying to set up a meeting with the president who had encouraged us initially to go after other initiatives and not just divestment and kind of think big. So we're hoping that he kind of lives up to that since he pushed us in that direction. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have something tangible moving forward. Um, I think today, if all went well, that we got official club status, that was something else. Because um, we really want it to be something that students next semester can plug into and really be a part of and hopefully connect with Post Oil too. Because um, it's been nice once people kind of got knowing about this going on and kind of making those connections. So we'll definitely keep people updated. Maybe I'll send out like something for you to send out mm -hmm. after the board meeting or maybe leading up to it and if anything changes. Um, but it's, yeah, and if there's any other ways for the community to be involved, it's <coughs> Saturday at the Race for the Reason if people want to come and support that. That'd be great. Yeah, I think that's where we're at right now. Um, also, this weekend, this Sunday, there's a major, uh, and I'm sure those of you on the mailing and on the listserv know this, a, a major action in D.C. Um, uh, supporting what is known as the Cowboy Indian Alliance, which is made up of people in the Southwest where Keystone is slated to go if Obama gives permission for it to open up. Um, we have arranged with 350.org for bus transportation from Brattleboro, and if you do, didn't get that email and are interested in it, let me know and I'll be sure to forward that uh, this evening so that you could take advantage of that. Also, I think that um, you found on your chairs um, a little down and dirty eval uh, of what went on tonight and what you'd like to have. We'd really appreciate the feedback, it doesn't have to be extensive, but um, it, it gives us some ideas. We had a great, a great feedback uh, last uh, month with suggestions, and in fact, Walter's already given me one uh, for the near future, which we'll attend to. So if you would take the time and just leave them up here on the table before leaving. Okay, um, let's go around and just make sure we all know who's here. So um, just introduce ourselves so Alan knows who we are um, and tell us where you're from. I'm Tim Stevenson. I'm with Post Oil, and I'm from Athens. Sherry Moore, I'm also with Post Oil Solutions, I'm on the board, and I'm from Athens as well. Jesse De La Rosa, I work as a nonprofit for health care reform. Tom Fennell from Brattleboro. Daniel Seekin, Donnerson. Hello. Oh. Walt Schwartz from Brattleboro. Janet Schwartz from Brattleboro. I'm Marie Proctor from Brattleboro. Jeff Johnson, Restorative Justice. Chuck Collins from Guilford and Jamaica Plain, Boston. Mary Waltz, also from the same places. <coughs> Alice Mays from Putney. My name is Chris Chapman. I'm from here in Brattleboro. Robert King, Putney. Marlene Everingham from West Brattleboro. Bill Pearson, Brattleboro. Roger Brown, Brattleboro. My name is Albert Wurzberger. I'm from Wilmington. I'm Caitlin Clark. I'm a student at SIT. I'm May Quilty. I'm also a student from SIT, originally from Boston. William Aludo, uh, native of Kenya, uh, former student at SIT. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, Laura Tarleton, Marlboro, Vermont. And I'm Alan Betts. That I'm, I'm the speaker tonight. So let's get on with tonight's program. Um, We've had uh, Dr. Alan Bates here before, a few years ago, when we used to do a monthly forum. Do you remember that, Alan, when you were down here and we did it at the Marlboro uh, Grad Center? Do you remember doing that for us? Uh, Alan is a climate researcher who has been supported by National Science Foundation and NASA um, as an independent scientist in Vermont. And he gives talks like this um, in, uh, around the state. Um, is considered by many to be a great, uh, not only a great speaker, but a knowledgeable person about climate change. And I think that what we're hoping tonight is Alan will not only um, 
uh, talk about climate change, what it is and all that, but really get to um, what we can be doing about it in, in, in ways that he sees fit. Uh, ladies, you're late, so would you like to introduce yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> Carrie? I'm Carrie Gibson. I'm the project manager for the Food Security Collaborative, which is a project of Coastal Solutions. And my Thank name you. is Kira Sawyer Hardigan, and I work for the supervisory union in town and also for Food Finance. And she was also the assistant manager at Post Oil's Winter. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Bay. Uh, Dr. Bay. Can someone fix the lights first? Okay. Um, well, we have an hour, hour and a half, and I'm going to give a talk that will run a little less than an hour, so we have plenty of time for discussion. And I'm going to run through a group of things. I'm going to talk about the science of climate change, some on the global scale, some on the local scale, with quite a bit of a focus on what's happening to Vermont, because my experience is if people really understand climate, the climate system in the Vermont context, it helps them understand the global picture, and it helps them also be able to communicate to people in the community in, in terms that they can understand. I will comment a fair bit on why extreme weather is increasing, because this was a bit of a surprise to us. I don't think 10 years ago we realized this was going to happen. And then I'm going to talk about the transition we face. I mean, the broad question of can we stabilize the climate? We made all sorts of promises uh, at the climate convention in 1992, but we haven't followed through on them. I'm going to talk about why it's difficult, which most of you understand very well and the issues about adaptation, and have some time for discussion. Our picture of our beautiful planet from January the 2nd, you can remember the date because I'm going to show you another picture in my garden on January the 2nd, 2012. Our beautiful planet sustains life. The burning of fossil fuels is driving the increase of greenhouse gases and melting the polar ice. The climate's warming, extreme weather is increasing, and water plays a crucial role everywhere, both as ice, water in the oceans, evaporation, condensation in clouds and storms, and as water vapor in the atmosphere. You can just see this blue haze around the planet here. That is the atmosphere of the Earth to scale. And the atmosphere plays a crucial role because the Earth is heated by the sun and it cools to space through the atmosphere. But there are several important greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide is only one of them. The most important is water vapor. And methane and ozone and all these synthetic chemicals we've made that are here, they stop the earth cooling so fast. And the effect of them, the gross effect of them, is to keep the earth about 50 or 55 degrees warmer than it would otherwise be. If we didn't have those greenhouse gases, the oceans would freeze, our civilization would never exist. But I'll come back to what's happening in detail in a moment. But the broad issue, I'm going to make a lot of very broad general remarks, because I think the broader the context which you understand what we are faced with and how we're going to have to deal with it, the easier it is to think in system terms. The the biggest issue we face is that our waste streams, all our waste streams, the things we're dumping in the atmosphere, like CO2 from burning of fossil fuels, the things that, there's some chairs down here and some chairs over there, um, things we dump in the rivers and then stuff that ends up in the oceans, they're all a problem now. They're interfering with the climate, they're interfering with ecosystems. So the broad picture of how those will affect landscape, water supplies, food system, human health, all these things are now interconnected. And it really requires changes of mindset, changes of strategies from what we cheerfully call business as usual, both to mitigate, to reduce the impact out for our children and grandchildren, but also to adapt to what's going on and we're committed to for the next few decades. And at the heart in my thinking is that we still have to act locally we have to face up to the issues in terms of adaptation and building resilience here in Vermont. And I hear that many of you are involved in aspects of this. So these are the kind of questions, broad questions, that I suggest people ask. 
you're confronted with something, some kind of choice in society or in your life or planning decisions, is this an efficient way of doing this? Because typically in our society, that it is not. And it means you have to map in some way in your own life, in your own house, your own transportation, from where we are now to where you would like to be in five or ten years. Managing our waste streams is a critical issue. But there's a much broader issue, is that the essential aspect of this problem is that we have lost our understanding and connection with the Earth system. We've gone our own way thinking we as a society, an industrial society, could do whatever we wanted. And so I believe that deepening your connection to the Earth is critical because we have to find a more collaborative way of working. And if I sum it up in a, uh, this particular thing, how to reintegrate all we know and understand given the deep interconnectedness of life and climate on Earth. The marker on the planet of what's happening, that people are following very carefully, has been the melting of the floating sea ice on the North Pole. This used to be its extent back, say, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, at the end of the melt season, which is mid-September. Half of it melted 2012, set a new record. It plays an important role in the climate system, and it's the same role that snow plays in our winters just had a cold winter, sharp contrast to 2012. If we have ice or snow on the surface, there's more reflection of sunlight. If this ice at the North Pole in the summer season melts, less reflection of sunlight. Ocean and ground absorb sunlight, ice reflects a lot of it. But there's a second feedback which is going on all over the planet. If we have less ice, oh, the water evaporates. More water in the atmosphere means a larger water vapor greenhouse. And that's amplifying the warming at the high latitudes. And if we don't have snow cover, like we didn't in 2012, evaporation continues from the surface, and we get a warmer winter, and the reverse, the one we just went through. At the North Pole, it's not just the ice. This is the change, the decrease, in fact, of the snow cover in June. And this is the amount of that snow cover, and you can't probably see the numbers, but this is the last 10 years, it's been almost a continuous decrease in the spring snow cover around the Arctic. And the snow plays the same role. If it's there, it reflects. If it's not there, more water evaporates, less sunlight is reflected. The Arctic, we call this the Arctic amplification of the climate. But let me shift for a few slides and sc scan over what's been happening in Vermont in the last 40 or 50 years. It's warming twice as fast in winter than summer, and our winter minimums are increasing even faster, two or three times faster than the winter means, having a big impact on what we can grow and on the agricultural aspects. We have a marker, frozen lakes, which are, we have one up the Eye on the Sky community has been keeping track of for 40 years, and I'll show you that frozen less seven days per decade, our growing season is getting longer and spring is coming earlier. And this surprise, extreme weather on the planet is increasing much faster than we expected it would. Part of that we understand because evaporation goes up steeply with temperature. But what has actually been happening is the global patterns of weather, think of the jet stream patterns, have been slowing down and becoming frozen in, in place a great deal, getting different extremes in different places. And I'll show some examples of that. A graph or two, this is winter, summer temperature, June, July, August, winter temperature, December, January, February, back to 1960, and a trend line. Variation, warm summers and cold summers, warm winters and cold winters, more variation in winter than in summer because this is impacted by our snow cover almost half a degree Fahrenheit per decade in summer and almost a degree Fahrenheit per decade in winter. And the warm winters here will be the less snowy ones and these will be the ones with more snow. It so happens I've been doing some, I've been talking about this for years and when I published a little paper on it they said, no data, where's the data? Well, by one of these fates of serendipity that I don't have time to go into here, Agriculture Canada called me up 18 months ago and said, we need your help. 
And the context here is that I can't access Canada's, da Canada's data, even though they have some of the best data sets in the world, because the Canadian data is for Canadians. They're not an open access type community, as many European countries are. Well, they ship me all the data, for the prayer is hourly data going back to 1953. And when it arrived, it, I knew it was going to change my life, and it has done. Because not only is it superb data, these Faithful technicians have observed the weather and recorded everything every hour, day and night, for 60 years. But they also recorded something that nobody else in the world ever records. The amount of reflective, opaque cloud that reflects the sun back and stops the earth cooling at night. And those are completely transformative. It tells you how much energy is reaching the surface, basically every hour for the last 60 years. And then they kept that data secret. Nobody knew it existed. I didn't know it existed until it arrived on my desk. So I've been writing papers as fast as I can, and this is a snapshot from one of them um, about the snow issues. And here, what I've done is I have 60 years of data from five stations in Saskatchewan on the prairies. This is mowed, uh, harvested fields covered with snow. And this is an average about the first day, they've been averaged about the day it snowed. So this is snow depth, and it goes up on the day zero. And the temperature drops about 10 centigrade, about 16, 18 Fahrenheit, 9, 16 in this. With snow fall, which averages around November the 15th on the prairies. And this is the melting of the snowpack, average date of March 26th in the spring. And you get the 10 degree rise of centigrade, 18 Fahrenheit. And these turn out to be very, very robust numbers. Vermont will be not quite as big because our open fields are not as much now. Forests don't reflect as much. But basically the temperature goes up or down very fast, a few days, with snow cover on the ground. Frozen lakes. Stiles Pond is this red curve and Joe's Pond there's a competition on the melt date. In fact, Stiles Pond melt date goes back to 1970 and this is the freeze up of Stiles Pond. And this is the number of days Stiles Pond's frozen. And that trend line is a decrease in the frozen winter period of seven days per decade. And notice again, large variation from year to year. Ice out coming earlier three days per decade, freeze up four days later. Think of this as being similar to what is happening to soil ice. <coughs> Everything is moving in the same way. This is heating degree days in Burlington, this red curve. The number of days below zero Fahrenheit they're just trending downwards over the decades with a lot of variation. This year will be a spike up. <clears throat> Hardiness, though, matters much more to our forests, to our shrubs, and to what will winter over under covered green greenhouses. The USDA zones, some of you will be familiar with those, zone four means the w winter minimum temperatures get down in the range minus 20 to minus 30, and that's this, this color here. This <coughs> Uh, medium blue shade. And this is the change over a 16 year period, 1990 to 2006. And you see Massachusetts went from zone 5 in the west to mostly zone 6 everywhere. And southern Vermont went from partly zone 4 to zone 5. That's a large change in 16 years. That means roughly a full half, it's roughly half a zone. It means a zone every 30 years, and a zone every 30 years is 10 Fahrenheit on this scale. If we go to the map, la latest map that's on the USDA website for Vermont, we get this detailed map showing all these subzones, half zones, and down here in Brattleboro was zone 5B, meaning temperatures down to about minus 25, back in, uh, no, minus 15, sorry, um, down, but the dose, the date. The average date was 1990s. The tradition was to do a 30-year average. And this 30-year average with that edge is already 24 years out of date, meaning that southern Vermont has already moved into zone 6. What was the minimum temperature you got here in Brattleboro last the winter just passed? Zero. Zero? Here. Yeah. Any, how, who got my, saw minus 10 up in the hills? We got it. At night. At night. It got cold and yeah. zero. Cold and zero. Yeah. But that's a huge increase on what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So, what's a winter minimum then? The winter minimum 
is the, re the importance of these is if you go to, for example, and buy a shrub, they'll tell you it's zone four, zone five, or zone six. Those zones are related to what the minimum temperatures are because typically it's the minimum temperatures that kill things. Whether it's bugs, like ticks, for example, or mosquitoes that are breeding, um, what winters over depends on the minimum temperature. If it, a minimum temperature of zero the lowest. is the lowest, yes, or 10, minus 10, or minus 20, each of those represents a climate zone colder. And zone, yes. Does that help you? Yes. It, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one because it gets cold every night. Yeah. And if you go to a climate website, you'll see there's an average minimum temperature. But these are the extreme minimum temperatures. The clear nights when the sky is very dry and there's very little water vapor, the Earth can then cool most of space. Those are the nights we get our frosts in fall and spring. They're also the coldest nights in winter. Under high pressure. Under high pressure and no cloud. Exactly. So at this rate, we're probably moving something like three zones per century if we stay on a high fossil fuel economy, which is huge. And here's my test question. Well, the good news is you can probably grow hardy peaches easily now in southern Vermont. The bad news is many pests survive in the winter, things that may attack our forests. Certainly ticks are now, have now reached, carrying Lyme disease, have reached the Canadian border. But here's a shrub, it's October the 1st, uh, 18 months ago, it's in my garden. What is it? Poison ivy? Nope. It's a little tree. Don't worry, the foresters never get this one right. So, uh, but occasionally... It's an avocado, it's an avocado yes. <laughs> uh, I compost all the organic waste from the food co-op in Rutland, so I get a crop of organic sprouting avocados every year. Well, it was October the 1st, it died. Uh, a, a week or two later with a frost. But my point is that if we're moving three climate zones this century, by the end of the century, hardy avocados will survive in Connecticut, which um, might horrify you a little because it really asks the, begs the question of what would happen to our forests. We can roughly halve this if we shift away from fossil fuels, but the time to do that is shrinking every decade. Um, the color is a bit lurid here, but this is the leaf out of lilacs that are about to leaf out soon. Large variation from year to year, and this trend is this three days per decade we saw on um, ice out. And the variation from year to year means something. This is a plot of the day of the year that lilacs leaf out against a temperature in the previous months. And this trend line here says that um, that lilacs will leave out nearly three days for every degree Fahrenheit was warmer the month or two before. And the same thing is for bloom. So uh, just, want, just to make you aware that everything in the natural world is connected, and temperature is a major driver of that. Little, we've seen a month variation in lilacs, say between 2012 and this year, for example, in the leaf out date. The same is, happens with maples, there's more data here. This is the leaf out of stages of maples, and I've plotted bunches of things here. They all move together. First and last frosts, though, what killed some, I put out a few tomato plants on our frost a few days ago, under glass, and I thought they would survive, and they didn't. Fortunately, I had half of them inside, and <laughs> the ones outside were almost all killed. Frosts are nights Again, when the Earth can cool to space, because there's no cloud, clouds are a really solid greenhouse, and there's little water vapor in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is dry, and the Earth can cool to space, and the temperatures can plunge at night and hit freezing. So it varies very much. Basically, think of cold air, dry air blowing down from Canada. Last frost in the spring, first frost in the fall, Day, growing season, the day, number of days between them, the number of days frost is likely. You can see the trend lines there. Um, this is the increase of the growing season of three, nearly four days per decade. Very important for agriculture and our food supplies. Well, I keep track of frozen ground in my garden. This is my cover crop. It is uh, 2012, which was an exceptionally warm winter. I'm turning over a rye cover crop. And I show this because you're of all ages in this group. I started gardening in Vermont in the late 70s. And if someone had told me I'd be t digging over my rye cover crop in January when I started, I would have laughed at them uh, 40 years ago. Um, 
that's a mark of how far we have come. The garden used to freeze up by mid-November and not melt again, like this year, till mid-April. But this particular year, year, we only had 67 days of frozen ground, very little snow cover, permanent nest in the Green Mountains. And in fact, the whole of the northern United States, this dark red, there's a number 117 on it, means it was the warmest six months in 117 years of record. Now when I, and you can contrast the snowy winter before and the one we just had, when I look at this, I ask myself, well, that's very interesting, what was happening in Canada? This is what we are shown by NOAA in the United States, and this is what the Canadians see for the same period. They don't see the United States, they just see Canada. <laughs> and I, I, this, is not, this is not frivolous. There's a, not a full exchange of data across this border, and many Americans can't even identify that point of Canada. Anyone tell me what that point of Canada is? Yes. Uh, Where does it touch the United States? I think that that's Roosevelt's cottage. <laughs> to 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 no. Yeah, that's Maine. Isn't it? No, it's not Maine at all. Not. This is Detroit. Oh. This is Detroit. Oh. It's oh. Windsor. <laughs> Windsor, yes. Oh, <coughs> it's, it's a frivolous point, but Canada always sees that. The U.S. always sees the U.S. without Canada. We do not have a free exchange of data across the border. And that year it was very warm in our winter. It was as high as 12 Fahrenheit, the whole three-month winter average in Canada. So you can understand these issues about the melting north are a very serious issue for Canada. What about Russian data? Sounds like that, that, uh, Another that picture you just showed sort of cried out for a, a look at further west. It certainly does. And it's, I will come back to that on the last <coughs> video here. And I don't have those maps. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, can, I know roughly what they were. It's an incredibly parochial view we take of the world. We had a cold winter. Washington had a terribly cold and snowy winter. The fact that California had record temperatures and drought, and Alaska record temperatures and drought, Europe record temperatures, and Britain downstream from the U.S. was flooded by severe st cyclonic storm after storm after storm developing downstream of our jet stream. Um, oblivious. What's happening is global in scale, and we're getting these extremes of weather globally, and we really ought to have what you're saying. We ought to have available to the public these maps on a monthly time scale of what's happening around the world. So we don't just think of it in insular our terms because what they have this year is what we may get next year. This is another year, same pattern. In fact, this is one of, this is the best I could find. I'm waiting for you know, more analyses. This is the United States and somewhere up in here uh, Here's the Canadian point of Canada, mm -hmm. right? Here's the Vermont somewhere up in here. And this is just someone, a map someone produced for the first three, four weeks of January, this winter. And this is higher in the atmosphere, 5,000 feet, not at the surface. And these are the cold contours of one of those polar vortex mm -hmm. that sunk down all the way down towards Florida. And these temperatures are very cold. This is almost 10, 8, 9 Fahrenheit three-month average cold. But notice California is the same, 8, 9 Fahrenheit, and Alaska and whatever that last province of Canada is there. Is that Nunavut? Or I don't remember. Do you see? No, this is north of there. What's the one in your mind? That shows my ignorance. I've forgotten what that one is. West ter Northwest Territories, yes. It is as warm as we were cold. Well, it's BC, and it's just, it's just right next to the Yukon. The Yukon is there, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, that peak, I think, is in the Yukon. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look ahead for... I'll come back to that uh, climate change patterns in a moment. When we look ahead, here's the kind of diagrams you can find in these reports. This is a um, climate assessment for the U.S. Mapping how the climate of Vermont in summer will move across the climate zones of the last century, 60 to 90, basically. And with two scenarios, business as usual, a high fossil fuel economy and for the rest of the century, climate of Vermont will look something like northwest Georgia by the end of the century. Or if we make a serious effort to shift to an efficient society and a renewable economy for energy, southwest Pennsylvania. That's a huge difference. And 
to tell you a joke about this, because we have to joke about these things. I gave this talk <coughs> in Vermont one day and flew down to Atlanta, Georgia the next day and gave a talk at Georgia Tech. And those tech, Georgia Tech students, they just laughed. Those Vermonters will have to get used to Georgia's climate, they said. Yeah, but Georgia. I waited a long pause and I said, <laughs> they were in the middle of their worst drought in history, and I said, what do you think is going to happen to the climate of Georgia? And there was that stillness in the room, that mirrored stillness in the room. What's happening is already is the subtropical drought areas are moving up into the southern United States. Georgia had a drought in 2009. Somebody had one in 2010. Texas had one in 2011 and 12. They had a very bad drought there. This year it was California. 2012 was most of the central US. All those things are happening on a global scale and this expansion of the tropical, subtropical drought areas. And it's going to affect agriculture and water supplies and indirectly affect us here in Vermont. Another reason for relocalizing our food supply. Well, a couple of transparencies on the big picture, just so that people can't fool you over this. Why is CO2 in the air a problem? The air is transparent to sunlight, most of it. 60-70% comes through to the surface. That warms the Earth. The Earth stays cool, it has to radiate that energy back to space, and that's controlled by the gases that trap the Earth's heat and re-radiate it back down, and they keep the Earth warm. That's a centigrade, think 50-something Fahrenheit. These are the greenhouse gases. Water vapor is the most important, carbon dioxide, ozone, methane, and the chlorofluorocarbons, the things we used to use in spray cans and refrigerators. The CO2 is rising fast. It's gone up about 40% in the last uh, century, uh, most in the last half of the last century, um, because of the burning of fossil fuels, and you know that. If it was only CO2, wouldn't it be much of a problem? It's a relatively small rate of impact, and you'll see people arguing about that. The problem is the CO2 lasts for centuries in the atmosphere before it's dumped out again in the oceans, and there are all these feedbacks, amplifying feedbacks in the water cycle. We already mentioned them. As the earth warms, there's more evaporation and water vapor increases. Water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas, there's lots of it. That triples the effect of carbon dioxide. So the water, and that happens within weeks. So that's a fast amplifier of what we burn in, in putting CO2 in the atmosphere. And then as the earth warms, snow and ice decrease, reflecting less sunlight. The winters and the Arctic are warming faster than the summers in the tropics. Think of N, roughly double. We know that if we double CO2, the average warming the Earth will be somewhere around 5 Fahrenheit, but much more in the north, over land, in winter. And this means the climate change we've been seeing in the last few decades in Vermont is going to continue. I asked a list. I should say this talk is on my website. So you can go to alanbetts.com, you can download this talk, along with all my other talks, um, and my writings for the newspapers that you don't see. That's just a list for the record. Extreme weather. I'm going to say a little bit about this before we move on to more general issues. It's very much harder to map precipitation because it falls locally in very intense pockets and where it rains here. A mile away it may not rain as much, and 10 miles away in that direction it might miss it. So precipitation's harder. And this is a statistic that's been created for the last 50 years, well, 58 to 07, of the increase in very heavy rainfall. They're defined as the days that have the highest 1% of the rainfall. And that's been increasing fastest in the Northeast, and the least in California. And that immediately tells you there's something strange happening here. Why is heaviest rain increasing most in, most in the northeast? And that's because the patterns of, say, the jet stream have been shifting. And related to this is that in the northeast where we live in Vermont, nine of the last ten summers have been wet, really wet, above 80% of average precipitation. The only one that was average was 2012, which people thought was pretty much a drought. And the U.S., central U.S., had really had a very serious drought. Well, what's happening is the precipitation, everything that drives storms is related to the condensation of water vapor. So 
squall lines, thunderstorms, hurricanes, they're driven by the latent heat that's released when water condenses. It takes a lot of energy to evaporate water, and you're familiar with that. You can put a pot on the stove. It's a classic high school physics experiment that perhaps one person here actually did. You put a, you know, a quart of water on the, and you boil it, bring it to the boil, and then you try to boil it away. Does anyone know how much longer it takes to boil it away than to bring it up to boiling point? It's about five times as long. It takes a lot more energy to boil water than to heat it up to boiling point. And that's what moderates the temperature on the surface, all the evaporation that goes on. When our forests, maple forests and deciduous forests leaf out in early May, the temperature actually drops on average, quite a few degrees, I think five degrees or more. Um, because right now there's very little evaporation and the sun is not a lot of cloud, the sun is pretty warm, temperatures rising very rapidly. So it's warm in the daytime, but clear and cool at night. All that changes very quickly in that week after leaf out. It will get cooler in the daytime and not as cold at night. Where was I going? Okay. Vapor pressure at cloud base goes up very steeply with temperature. So all our storms are getting more intense. Think we're having more and more of tropical rainfall, if any of you have been to the tropics in the rainy season. But something else is happening that's completely independent of that. The large-scale flow, think of the patterns of jet streams, are becoming more stationary all the way around the globe. And what that means is we get longer rain events in the low-pressure areas and longer droughts in the high-pressure areas. And these are what we cheerfully call quasi-stationary, and the forecasters will call them blocking patterns, are getting more and more frequent. We think it's because the Arctic is warming, but although we've had quite a few papers in the last few years, parts of this puzzle have not yet been sorted out. And here's, but here's an example of it. 2011, Vermont and New York, we had record spring floods on Lake Champlain in the spring, a lot of melt of snow, Double the normal precipitation in April and May, high temperatures. Lake Champlain, you may not even be aware of it down here, but Lake Champlain came up three feet above flood stage and stayed there for a couple of months. Never done that before. And then we had Irene come through in late August. And it was pretty much wet all year, which is what this one shows. This is the same thing for precipitation for a six month period that I showed for temperature. And Ohio to Vermont had the wettest six months on record, 117 years of record. But notice Texas and New Mexico had the driest six months on record. So what does that tell you? That in that six month period, all the storms avoided Texas and came up the East Coast. So within that, we had two record floods, but they were all interconnected. Irene would not have been the catastrophe it was if it hadn't been wet all summer. The ground was wet when Irene dumped six inches of rain on it. We've had other tropical storms go through at the end of a summer when the ground is typically dry and the first couple of inches get soaked up by the ground. Didn't happen with Irene. It all had to run off in a hurry. But notice this. This is symptomatic. I happen to be giving some talks on uh, the climate problems down in Texas just a week ago. And they're obsessed with 2011. It's their prototype drought year. Vermont is, the Agency of Natural Resources, is really obsessed this is our prototype flood year. Yeah. And uh, same thing from a global perspective, stationary pattern here. And here's an example from last year. The high amplitude jet stream patterns that don't move. The date here is July the 1st, and this pattern sat there for a couple of weeks in June, ending on that date. And we had a serious flooding in Vermont under this jet stream up here in the north here. Alaska had record 90 degree temperatures. And Death Valley, they thought, hit a new record, didn't quite break their old record of 128. One pattern. And the cold uh, surges this winter, a similar kind of pattern. When Sandy came by, it was another example of the same unusual, a blocked jet, very strong jet stream pattern, bringing cold Arctic air down, and it, this pattern, a block, is the blocking pattern, high pattern here, east of Canada, 
And Sandy came up the coast and instead of going out to sea as tropical storms and hurricanes usually do, it was sucked into this strong uh, jet stream pattern there. Very, very strong intensification, very strong soil surge, and you probably didn't realize that the mountains of Virginia has got two feet of wet snow. It was a, but that was ignored because Manhattan and the New Jersey shore were devastated. And this is the one I was just showing. Um, if we were to, this, the, you have to can imagine the rest of it because I don't have a global picture yet. There's a Gulf Stream here, strong gradient, cold, warm across the Gulf, Gulf Stream. That intensified our jet stream here, the jet stream going down like this, and across the Atlantic, along under that strong jet stream, almost record cyclone after cyclone after cyclone developed. And Britain was flooded for three months. And this jet stream was going up there and came down, and southern Europe had record temperatures. Somewhere in Siberia, yes, there was another cold outbreak like this one. Uh, slightly west of, east of central Siberia. The global pattern, very interesting. There, I do have an analysis of it from the British Met Office that had to write a special report on the flooding if anyone wants it. So I'm coming to the end of this sort of scientific review of what's happening to our climate. What lies ahead? We're going to shift directions. Accelerating change, increasing extremes, increasing adaptation and rebuilding costs, and downstream, if we stay on a fossil fuel economy, environmental damage that will transform or destroy ecosystems, both locally and globally. The cause, we understand, freely dumping our waste streams into the atmosphere, streams, lakes, oceans, is simply not sustainable. We have no idea what the long-term costs are, but one economic estimate is that the cost of our infrastructure and civilization is a thousand trillion downstream. And I don't need to tell you those are huge numbers. It simply means we're dumping on our children and grandchildren the costs they cannot possibly pay for, along with all the other things that we've been dumping on them. Because we are unwilling to pay any fossil carbon taxes or waste taxes. We've always dumped our wastes for free. Why can't we all be grandfathered in? Right. That's the attitude of our industrial society. It would cost a little more. One of the things that was in the last uh, IPCC report coming out this year is that the costs of the transformation of our society are relatively very small. And the numbers that I, I haven't got it on the slide here, but I'll tell you what it is, to remember is that for every trillion dollars we spend now, it's not cheap, spending a million doesn't do much, but every trillion we spend now, we save roughly 60 trillion dollars worth of damage downstream. It's a 60 to 1 gain. Right. Uh, this figure, of course, is huge. So, can we stop dangerous climate change? Well, the world made the promise when the Framework Convention on Climate Change back 22 years ago now, that we would do this. Very easy to make promises. You will know how people love to make promises, particularly politicians. It sounds good. Well, we could do it. We'd have to stabilize carbon dioxide. We actually have the technology to do it. But this is an 80% drop in CO2 we needed to stabilize, and the longer we wait, the higher the level it will stabilize at. And that's difficult for us. It's very difficult for us because fossil fuels have driven our industrial growth and our population growth for a couple of centuries. And everybody feels that their lifestyle in the industrialized world, uh, we, we deserve our lifestyle. It's become dependent on fossil fuels. It will require an effort to make this shift. So I have a few slides, though, on the broader issues. Because the broad issue here is how do we really manage our relationship to the Earth? How do we do that? Um, there are the technologists out there who believe we should simply manage the Earth. The problem is, and there are the people who don't want to manage our society because we're a free economy is much better. The underlying issue is because of the interwovenness between our technology, our waste streams are having large global impacts on the natural world. They have to be carefully managed because we're dependent on natural ecosystems. And our society as a whole has simply not grasped that. Uh, they haven't grasped the distinction between our technological world, which is now having an impact on the natural world, uh, 
Well, I'll come back to this that particular one. We have to have some new rules. Our numbers, our population, our industrial output are now so large. And the rules we have run our society on were to maximize consumption and profit. And they've actually led to our present predicament. So most of the arguments you'll hear and most of the strategies that are still common in planning across Vermont are still to maximize growth of the economic system and maximize everybody's profit. So anything that costs more, avoid it. Everything that is a shift away from an economic growth system is an issue. So the corollary is that a path towards sustainability is simply a, a set of things we have not done before, but we could easily cast these as engineering principles and design principles for everything we do. But you, <laughs> I'm going to a meeting later this year of the planning associations in northern New England, uh, their annual meeting at Snow, and some has set up this to be the theme. But I can... You can imagine the challenge of training, retraining all the planners in Vermont to think in terms of a different set of principles. But this is a challenge you have for the local community here. Um, someone needs to infiltrate and start this dialogue and be persistent. We have to minimize the lifetime of all our waste products in the Earth system and eliminate critical wastes. We did that for one thing, the ozone depleting gases. It was a tremendous success and it was driven through by the Republicans with global regulation, for those of you who have forgotten the 19, uh, the two presidents that did that. We have to maximize recycling and remanufacturing to minimize our waste streams and the use of non-renewable raw materials. Many of our non-renewables are going to become limiting in the next few decades. We have to do that. It's simply tell the engineers to do it and they say, no problem, why didn't you ask before? Um, some countries like Germany have moved down this, for, particularly for electronics. Maximize the efficiency with which we use energy and fresh water. This is not a critical issue here, but almost everywhere further south on this planet, fresh water is a critical issue. Then we can maximize renewable resources. And relocalization is a different, independent theme because it's the, really the only way to reestablish responsibility and control. Efficiency comes first, is energy efficiency. We have to double or triple it. There's no way we are very inefficient because we had cheap fossil fuels for decades. There's no way we can replace our current fossil fuels with biofuels and renewable energy. And don't let people fool you about that. The other critical issue you're probably well aware with this group is that our traditional oil and gas reserves are relatively limited. But there's enough coal and oil shale reserves to push CO2 well above 1,000 parts per million. And that, we know, will melt the ice caps. And uh, another question, how much will sea level come up if we melt the ice caps? 260 feet. Yeah, something in excess of a couple of hundred feet. There's a lot of compensation goes on. Um, how many of you know how much lower sea level was when 14,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age? Should be in elementary school. <laughs> it's the origin of the great flood when all that melted. Well, it's more than that, it was over 300 feet. And it was all the land bridges that connected the continents were there at the end of the last ice age period. So the peoples that moved into North America came across when sea level was 300 plus feet lower. Well, the way to think about this cut aside all that noise of the people who don't believe it's happening, we can't predict all the details, etc., etc., is that if we burn all that fossil carbon that was taken out of the Earth back in the Carboniferous era, we will push the climate back to something like the Carboniferous climate. It's that simple, a hothouse with no ice caps. The only way we can get around that is if we remove CO2 at source, like at the power plants, and pump it back into the Earth. And that's a lot of liquid CO2 to pump back into the Earth. And it costs more, and nobody wants to build and pay for that. It's basically pumping as much CO2 back in as we take oil out. Difficult for us. Well, these are not scientific issues at all. This is the view of someone who's only been in this country for 40-something years, who grew up in Europe. But you all know what I mean by the American dream. Economic growth was based on fossil fuels, debt, and consumerism. And it's been simply unsustainable. It's been a disaster for the planet. It's was also the British dream as well. 
Individual rights are a big issue in the US. States' rights, individual rights were a central feature of the Constitution. The Constitution gave no rights to the earth, no rights to the native peoples of this land. They were not an issue back in the late 1700s. But we have to balance what we think of as our rights against the needs of the Earth's ecosystem. And the reason for that is the Earth's ecosystem wins hands down. Not us. We have to deal with the Earth's ecosystem. And this other issue is we have to figure out how to guide and manage technology. We have just worked on a philosophy. People invent things and they try to market them. If they can create a market, then it goes. And the results are enormous successes and catastrophic failures. And we never look at this whole ensemble and think about technology. It's an issue, of course, for the purely practical reason the fossil fuel reserves are worth $20, $30 trillion and typically go up every year or two. And they, that people, they're nobody's going to give away that amount of money. It's trivial for them to spend a very small percentage of that on misinformation and confusing people because that's a good business plan. And the financial markets have not downgraded the value of those, meaning that the financial markets think it's all going to get burnt. So, and of course there's all sorts of strategies uh, that we've never had to regulate emissions, we've had to pay the costs, it's not fair cost. All this is just ignoring the real Earth system issues, and I don't need to mention to you that the politics in Washington are facing collapse on these issues, really disconnected. Which is why local transition efforts, in all the many forms that you're involved in, and the other groups here, the energy groups, and the transition towns in Vermont, all those are critical efforts. We have to deal with two aspects of this problem, helping people understand what is happening, helping the state, which is more under our control, move through this transition. Surely technology can save us. Well, ExxonMobil CEO last year for the first time admitted that climate change was a problem. But it's a technology problem. Technology caused it, technology will fix it, was his attitude. What's wrong with that attitude? It's not the real problem. <laughs> it's not the real problem. Say more. Well, I just read that um, even in the, the, the climate change debate, the, the science, that the teaching people science doesn't work. That um, all, it, all it actually does uh, is um, further the divide uh, because people are camped in no, their own in their scientific camps. interpretations. Yeah. Yes. And the issue is. Uh, is where people's, this article said, the issue is where people's values are. Right, well we'll come back to that. Maybe particular. you'll get to that later We'll get on. to that in a general discussion more. The technological problem is the one I mentioned already, that our technology is having a global impact on the natural world that's both alive, complex, and outside our control. So the argument that this is a technological problem, we'll find a technological solution, somehow is it, it includes the assumption we can manage the natural world, control climate change, put mirrors up in space, take everything out of the atmosphere we put in. But the easy thing to do is to manage our own technology and our waste streams because we're dependent on the natural world. But this is an ideological shift for us. And uh, uh, this belief is still very widespread in society among the technological world. But here's an example. We need technology. We need it for the transition. But we have a big transportation problem in Vermont. Vast majority of the people, single occupancy vehicles, are driving around in trucks. Yeah. Or their equivalent. Still. Average gas mileage maybe 20 if you're lucky. Less in winter. If you're lucky. Yeah, but those arrows get stuck in the snow. <laughs> well, I, I grant you this, but I'm just going to put this one for illustration. These are tricycles, electric, 150 mile range, they're joystick controlled. They might not do well in Vermont. Um, you might have put studied snow tires on them. And they're certainly, if you live up in the hills, you know, up on a, a muddy road, no. Something bigger than this. But these are kind of represent the two polar extremes. Are we going to draw on driving trucks with low gas mileage, or are we going to build lightweight vehicles, maybe with four-wheel drive, 
uh, we're just starting to see the first of those, uh, I think it's, uh, it's the Mercedes-Benz lightweight redesigned electric car from the ground up. So we know one of those German companies is building one. Fiberglass or some composite as opposed to steel. But think about, this is the kind of radical change we're going to need if we're going to live scattered across the hills of Vermont downstream. We're either going to make more liquid fuels from electricity, and we might have that technology in 10 years, but we'll be so much better if we have lighter vehicles. Okay, a few things on food issues. Some of you have a hand and an interest in this. The milder winters and the longer growing season. Overwintering more crops under those unheated greenhouses and row covers, each of those gives you something like another climate zone. We've already moved one climate zone. Have to deal with increasing variability of winter, increasing precipitation extremes, and that means managing water, soil water, floodplain management. Those are becoming increasingly critical issues for Vermont. Summer pests, uh, the rise of mosquito and tick-borne diseases are becoming a challenge for our medical system. And the, the epidemiologists are holding meetings on climate change now. But not us, but further south, increasing drought to be expected. And there's critical water issues I've managed. Many of the pumped aquifers are nearly exhausted. Another dimension, a good reason for localizing the food system. Well, a few simple suggestions. These are not simple, of course, but the way I think about the problem is, and I've been going around Vermont now for about five, six, seven years, I decided I would focus on Vermont, and it was my responsibility to try and explain what was going on. I did some of the research you saw here, and over time, almost all of the professional groups across the state call on me to come to their annual meetings and nudge their communities to think about change. But this re-education of society and all its interconnected systems is huge, and the transition we face is very large. We have to keep asking, as you are doing here, what will raise people's awareness? What will change the paradigm? Look for opportunities, look for leverage points, and ask the fundamental issue, how are we managing our relationship to the Earth? Understand water and the landscape. Lake Champlain has big projects and big issues because phosphorus washes off the farms, it washes off the fertilizers we put into make our grass, you know, chem lawn, make our grass look greener in the summer. All that is a problem downstream. And on the grand scale in the US, the amount of effluent that's of fertilizers that goes now into uh, the Gulf of Mexico is producing large dead zones. Baltic Sea has always been killed by that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese uh, fresh rivers that flow into the ocean. The problem globally. And the issue is that it's a waste issue. When you use something, ask where it's going. Don't dump fertilizers on your lawn. And if your neighbors point out it's going to go into those rivers, it's going, in this case it's going to go into the Connecticut River. Examine all our waste streams. Aim to recycle and manufacture everything. That's going to change societal change. Vermont has now passed fairly extensive recycling, mandated recycling for all organic waste and all other stuff by the year 2020. And a step-by-step -step progression starting next year. Um, that's a big, we have one-stop recycling now in Rutland, which has been a huge step forward. I can throw everything, and they recycle all the plastics now up to, except the styrofoam. I don't know if you've got that yet here in this area, have you? No. No. Well, push for it. It's a part of re-educating the community that there is no such a thing as a waste stream anymore. Everything needs to go into fully recycled systems. And it's surprising that it's just one key part of this broad transition we need to get people to think about. It's effort at first, but after a little while, people just do it. They complain for a while, and then they do it. I've watched churches do this, you know, they had all this throwaway stuff, well, you don't have throwaway stuff, and they ch the big church in Rutland changed one year, and they were amazed. People complained for three weeks, and then they got used to using cups. And now nothing is thrown away in that particular large church. All your communities, everywhere you go, 
object if there's still large uncycled, recycled waste fields? Yeah, the hospital. Hmm? Hospital. Well, the hospital's going to have to separate all its food waste, I think, 2015 by the summer because it's a large user. Um, there are histories in hospitals because everything is based on a throwaway economy there too. A sterile throwaway economy. Relocalize the food system. Recycle everything. We are going to have to compost all organic waste by the end of the decade in Vermont. Default energy use should be off. Now it's a simple thing, but the story behind that, and I may be aware of it, is IBM of 10 years ago now, in, up in its Williston factories, they were, their energy costs were huge. And they were going to have to close the plant down. And somebody said, well, we should do something about energy use. And they did. They set up a committee. And the first year, they found a 10% reduction. And the second year, they found a 10% reduction. And within a few years, they realized they could have this energy committee running for the next 50 years and get a few percent every year. And then they realized everything in that factory should be off unless it was needed. And that was a radical shift. <laughs> but it's a simple shift that it also is true of our society. If you go into a modern building, the lights come on in front of you and the lights go off behind you. Um, but we still don't think about that in our homes, even though we now have the technology to do those sort of things. And look at your life, look at your society, look at your places you work, and ask about why they haven't maximized energy efficiency in housing, transport, and power. And then it makes sense to add and monitor renewable power. The boom in so photovoltaics in Vermont is, is a real shift in, uh, a real shift. It's going much faster here than in much of the southern United States, which has political objections to it, and yet has much more sunshine. And it's the way that we're going to be able to lift people out of uh, poverty in the rest of the world through photovoltaics, not by power plants. And my last point I made already at the beginning, and I'll make it again, reconnect with the natural world. We don't send our teenagers out on vision quests anymore, but we should start thinking about what it is to really feel be part of the natural world. And I suggest it's fundamental if we're going to accept the broader nature of this transition and find ways, creative ways, that we can work with the Earth. Well, this is a shift yet again. Attitude matters. This is one of my lines to teenagers when I'm talking to high school kids. It's a question of attitude. And attitude, the basic simplified version I'm giving is hope versus despair. People often ask me, why am I hopeful? And many groups of dealing with the issues you have, people find it difficult to stay hopeful. And the answer is that it's a much deeper question. Hope is really a spiritual connection to everything. It expands our vision, it connects us to each other, and it deepens our sense of communion. And of course, it connects you back to the earth as well. And in symbolic terms, hope opens doors, opens doors that despair would close. And it makes us much more creative, much more joyful in our ability to work with each other and with the earth. And we need all these things because this is a very challenging problem. It's, we need an attitude that will help us be flexible, change our minds, encourage other people to change, and not be fearful. So what do we need? Well, we need honest, truthful, and smart pathways. These are challenges for our society, where deception is endemic, politicians never tell the truth, and it won't go into smart, that will not frighten people into paralysis. We tend Many environmental movements tend to make people, uh, this is a fearful prospect if we don't do something. But as the gentleman back there was mentioning, people don't respond to that. They just become more protective. The issue here is this is something we have to deal with. Let's be smart about it. Let's spread hope, not anger or despair. Sidestep all the ideology that's rooted in our system, all the dreams about the American vision, the problem here on a global scale is that every country has its own dreams, ideologies, and they don't always overlap. And it's very confusing when you, see, you watch right now, for example, in Russia versus the US, those two opposing dreams for what they want, and Ukraine in the middle there. Ideology, or, or Latin America in the US, everywhere this issue goes on. Every country has its 
things that are only, and this is why in a way we don't get much, I think, international news. We need adaptive governance on a global scale. I mentioned this already. And we have to have things that will respect the Earth system processes and limits because, as I mentioned, the Earth system wins this struggle that's going on at the moment. Not us. Another comment. Uh, some of you will know Francis Moore Le Pay. We, the future's not our past. We create the future. We have to plan for the transition to a sustainable society. And I love Francis Moore Le Pay's motto. She said, when I look back on my 30 years of working on food issues, my motto is bold humility. You have to be bold to face change. And yet she said, I'm tremendously humble when I look at what has happened that I could never have envisaged was possible when I started on this path 30 years ago. And the same, I think, is going to be true of our development of renewable technologies, along with an efficient society. We've got to balance community things that you can do here and pressure upscale on our governments. And I've asked these questions already. Is it an efficient and sustainable way of doing it? Do I understand the Earth? Ah, we've come to the end. Good. So, if we can have the lights again, then we have plenty of time for discussion. Yes. You mentioned the two Republican presidents and the methyl fluorocarbons. I mean, yes. I remember when that happened, and it, it seemed insurmountable that we were going to hit such resistance because of money. I mean, think of all the refrigeration and every right. supermarket, or, and yet it happened. So I'm curious to know what the plan was behind that. Yeah, well, that's very, it's a very, very illuminative one, which we never hear. She's asking what happened back. It was President Reagan and George H. Bush. And we discovered the ozone hole over Antarctica back in the mid-80s and realized very fast that this was an indicator that chlorofluorocarbons, the chlorine that broke down in the upper atmosphere, was destroying ozone. And we knew that we depend on the ozone. The ozone is a greenhouse, but the primary role is it filters ultraviolet. And all of life on this planet will be damaged by having increase in the ultraviolet. And Reagan was not a scientist, but he listened to the scientists. And he said, this is an unacceptable risk. And he actually pushed through over business opposition, European opposition, with the collaboration of, I think, the Environmental Defense Fund, but I'm not sure about that, um, a strategy for global regulation, which was the Montreal Protocol. Every country was to set up an office that still exists, they still function very, very smoothly, to do an inventory of all the ozone-depleting gases, as they were called, and have a clear strategy for replacing them. And that went through very smoothly in the late 80s. And then George H. Bush, the first senior George Bush president, pushed through the Clean Air Act amendments in, I think, 1991 or 92 with the st a strong EPA director, Riley his name was, uh, EPA administrator, whatever the title is. And that phased out the US ozone depleting gases and particularly the refrigerants over a very tight schedule because it was already clear the problem was getting serious. And that drove the global movement. It was simpler in a way because the industry that made the chlorofluorocarbons could make the hydrofluor, the HCFCs, and then the HFCs, and now they're trying to phase them out because they're still greenhouse gases. Uh, and they're going to do it under the Montreal Protocol because that one simply works. And nobody has ever argued about it. And the reason they haven't argued about it is that if we had it not gone through that, we would already be deep into an ozone catastrophe <coughs> with absolutely nothing we could do about it at this point. Um, but it was global regulation, and it was pushed through by the Republican Party. And I think the, the, the facetious answer is at this point, the Republican Party moved away for ideological reasons, and the Repu Democrats don't want to recognize it because it was a Republican achievement. <laughs> it was the greatest environmental achievement of the last century from and the I, Earth's perspective. I imagine it went against big business. It, it, it went against well, they all made their usual objections. Just as the, the automobile industry objects to, every industry objects when it's faced with change. But mostly, it's a those things are technological and they're easy to change. 
when, how many people do you know how much more efficient our refrigerators are now than the same size 1975 refrigerator? How much? But it's how much? Yeah. Make a guess. Yeah. Ten times as efficient. It's actually only about five or six. <laughs> the, ref you know, the refrigerator manufacturers in 1975, there was an oil crisis in a couple of years, so we decided we had to cut back on energy use. And they said, oh, this is going to cost a lot of money, and it's, you know, and they went to their engineers and said, can we do it? There was a set of standards, now 5% this year, 10% next year, 15%, that have gone on for 40 years with no one's interference. The engineers said, no problem. Why didn't you ask the four? I mean, and we have <coughs> cut the energy used by refrigerators by a factor of five, and they cost half as much in constant dollars as they did in 1975. Mm -hmm. Nobody interfered for 40 years. And we started down that path with automobile efficiency, the so-called CAFE standards in the same era. We doubled the efficiency of our cars from roughly 10 to 20 in the 10 years from like 75 to 85. But what happened? Detroit objected. Detroit objected and the oil companies objected because it was so successful on a global scale, the price of oil dropped to $5 a barrel. We aren't making enough money, they said. And those standards were frozen for the next 20 or 30 years. The standards that were in place for 1992 are as high as the standards we're going to reach this decade. And the automobile industry had already agreed it could do it. We simply did not stay the course. I drive a 1999 Ford Escort and I get over 30 miles, miles to the gallon. But that can't be done these days. Well, and, and it, unless you buy a hybrid car, which will get you 50 miles to the gallon. But, you know, never mind. I just want to say a few things. I, I'm, um, I'm betting a, a fair amount of my retirement on, actually it's my wife's, on <laughs> Tesla. And Tesla today, he announced that he was going to start building electric cars in China, and their <coughs> stock went up $16 a share. And I really believe, uh, I, I have a really hard time with wind turbines, uh, industrial wind production in Vermont, because I think it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what China is putting out for CO2. And so you have someone like Tesla who's using the market, and he's going to try and make money. It's capitalism for environmentalism. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I truly believe it's the right thing to do. And the Chinese are at a point where they, they have no choice. They can't breathe in their cities. Yeah. And um, I'm hoping that there, there, there'll be a, a golden mean that takes place that the Chinese government is going to make it easy for Tesla to do what he needs to do. And, and we may see some... <coughs> very wealthy people and and a lot more movement towards totally carbon free there is a huge there's a huge amount of development going on technologically i think tesla i think is investing in stationary lithium batteries for energy storage as well uh, on yeah, a grand there's, scale i there's read about still that i'm not sure i'm not teasing us that panasonic is going to help them build it well, I don't know whether that's going to happen. But that changes our renewable energy perspective. It's also becoming prevalent on a much smaller scale in, I think it was in California and other states, where a lot of solar power is being invested. If you have local storage, then it becomes a more of a day-round mm -hmm. storage. And you can also link that storage to the grid. Or you can link the cars to the grid with their right. own battery systems. There's lots of possibilities there. And that's the technology trying to solve the problem. Technology trying to solve it. It doesn't solve the efficiency end of things. That in fact, we still have to double or triple energy efficiency and things. But it's, it raises objections from the traditional utility industries. Not so much in Vermont, but it is doing around the rest of the country. I mean, they're... They're very upset at the, of course they are. the, the threat <laughs> of people making and storing their own power locally. But that's obviously 
one part of a transition from health. We, we got metering back in Vermont. We, we have an excellent system. So here. Our community solar system, you can just go out and buy four or five kilowatts of power to offset your electricity. Um, yeah. um, it's an investment, it's a no-brainer. It's a 7% yeah. return tax-free on your money yeah. off your electric bill. But, but yes. With batteries and other technology, there's a lot of mining involved. Yes, there's a and whole there's set of issues solution. with mining right. too. Right, yes. and not only the mining life, but there's a whole um, class issue. There are. Because who is mining those right. very toxic things? And are they being mined where there's no regulation? And with it all being dumped into the rivers and the streams? Et cetera, et cetera. Right, where you see that happening all over the globe because it's the cheapest thing to do. And that's how a capitalist system backs, works. And it's on the backs of the poor. It's on the backs of the poor. That is right. That may be the fly in the ointment, but I will take a lithium mine over the tar sands mine, hands well, down. You, well, but so. you could also have good regulation of these things. Sure. And be willing to pay a little more for them. For the, yeah. It, it, yeah, and you're going to have to... The trouble in this global economy is we do not know what is happening all the time. You know parts of the puzzle, but when the car comes back from China, we don't know how many cities were polluted there, how much of it came from coal fire stuff, the conditions of the people that... We moved our manufacturing there, and with that we moved a lot of our responsibility. We now... The U.S. is now proud that its CO2 emissions have actually declined the last few years. But that's because we've exported. We've exported it all exactly. exactly. Uh, we I mean, exported the problem. A, <laughs> you can't you can't find foundry products in the U.S. They're, they're in India. Well, so Sorry. there are a whole set of system interconnected issues here that involve people, that involve resources, that on and but that is why. I had a few slides in here. You need to focus and understand the big picture. The, if you can ensure that our society moves towards recycling everything and remanufacturing everything, then the waste streams and the raw materials and the issues wider in the world become less. But it's not a simple problem. Yes? I, I had two comments I would hope would be helpful to the, point, the points that you have brought and are making today. And one is, what I'm observing is that uh, cost is a driving factor of adaptation. Just the, hitting, hitting your pocketbook is a big motivator. Um, mm -hmm. And we have seen in this area that there's a little firm that uh, advertises almost every day at the, in the top corner of the first page of the newspaper. It's a company that helps people insulate their houses and do something even bigger than that, which is to point out the importance of air sealing, which for the cost of a case of caulking can reduce your home's uh, fuel consumption by 30% before you get to the more expensive stuff. And the, the, right. the, adapt, the, the cost of the fuel keeps going up. You know, we're, we're feeling lucky we're paying only $3.60 for gasoline, three sixty seven today. Right. Um, and, and yet, um, that, that cost keeps going up. We're seeming to get used to it, like the frog in the in the boiling you know, in, in, the, in the heating pot. Um, and and but people are responding to the economics yes. of the problem. Um, we've got uh, you know the solar cells communities. Those wouldn't have been around if they hadn't made so much sense. If solar cells weren't getting cheap, and yes. the cost of the alternative getting so high, um, the recycling and composting is something where you know you're doing this because it's going to be not so long before it's going to cost more to throw stuff away um, and so on. Um, so I, I, I'm seeing from an economic point of view sure. that what we're looking to accomplish is actually starting to happen perhaps but not from conscious, conscience so much as economic. cost. Yes. yes. The other point I'd like to make in support of what you've been saying is to point out some resources I have found to be just excellent, excellent beautifully written things. One is you were talking about our um, ignorance of what's going on in foreign affairs. You know, you can read Foreign Affairs magazine, which is quite dense, or you can read The Economist, which is quite dense and boring. Or there's a little magazine out called The Week that is a compendium of news and commentary, which I have found extremely helpful. Um, and then there are three books that I would point out to people that are just superb 
One is the book 1793, which gives a wonderful, I don't know if you're familiar with it, yeah, oh my gosh, it talks about the, uh, the economic and environmental effects um, that followed as, as great echoes of Columbus's um, travels to the New World and how many things, it, how it changed the global economy. Do you mean 1493? That's what I meant. What did I say? So so 300 years ago. Sorry. Trying to get 1493. You've you, you heard, you heard of, of 1493? 1492. No, no, 1493. No, I haven't read it. It is just unbelievably good. Um, Francis Moore LePay's book, which came out in the early 80s or late 70s, called Diet for a Small yeah, Planet, yeah, that one is, is, is really yes. a landmark book. Um, and um, for those of us um, educating children, uh, uh, Dr. Seuss' book, uh, The War Acts, <laughs> is, is really a seminal work. I mean, it really is. It's like a textbook without the boring facts. You know, the, the, remember the, the theme of it, there's no such place as a way. Mm -hmm. yes. So for throwing things away. Yes. Any, mm -hmm. Any comments on your first section there? Certainly economics and costs are driving significant important changes. We should be willing to push them a little. Mm -hmm. Because um, with, it would be a good, a good conceptual help for our society to realize we actually need a carbon tax and that we need the money from the carbon tax to pay for some of the adaptation mm -hmm. costs, mm -hmm. to invest in things downstream. We actually crept in an, a new fuel tax because as cars get more efficient, we don't have enough to pay for our roads. Mm -hmm. It was, but they couldn't call it a carbon tax. But Vermont now has a, a de facto gasoline extra tax that was put in just for that kind of purpose. But we need it for all the infrastructure and adaptation costs downstream. Mm -hmm. And we should get used to paying a bit for it. Mm -hmm. There's one country among all its other evils that's doing some of that, which is Norway, where it's investing massive amounts of money for the future and around the globe um, out of the oil reserves from the North Sea. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, cheer what's going, but let's culturally nudge it along. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to say something? Well, I, I wanted to uh, agree and underscore your emphasis on um, local efforts, on transition, on adaptation uh, that we all need to be doing because um, climate change is not only here, it is going to get worse, and you made that point earlier in your discussion. The whole phenomenon of climate lag uh, where we will experience uh, um, things in a much more severe form than we have up to this point. But I'd like to say that there's another side. In addition to adaptation and mitigation, um, there is or adaptation and, um, and resilience. There is also the whole business of, of dealing uh, with the, um, the energy companies who are at this point locked into the idea of, of drilling and, and extracting uh, every ounce of oil they can. Um, and especially the unconventional fuels such as tar sands, fracked oil, and stuff like that, which have a much uh, greater impact on our environment. Um, so I'm wondering what you would suggest in terms of what I see is, is the need to build a political will, not only in, in the halls of, Con <coughs> of Washington, but amongst the populace, where polls say that while Americans are more knowledgeable and aware of and accepting of climate change, it's a very low priority in terms of doing anything about it. And I feel like anything short of a, of a large popular movement to change this will, will uh, doom us to um, some very uh, catastrophic circumstances. So I'm wondering how you see that issue of the, po of the politics, which you did mention. I mean, you talked about it being, uh, our politics being bankrupt. Um, I, would I would say that our government has been captured and is owned by uh, corporate interests and largely the oil industry. How do we reverse that? How do we, ch how do we build that popular movement that could uh, change that? It sounds like you have to come out and support Reagan. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Get Reagan back in the Yeah, just recognize that ketchup is a vegetable and you're, and you're, and you're on your way. <laughs> well, this is not really my field. Um, everything you say is true. And everything about our political system is very hard to change. It's vested in money and the politicians are paid for by people who have lots of money. And we are in an exceptional situation here in Vermont because our, we can elect politicians who are not bought 
are not purchasable either because they don't need it for re-election. Mm. They are re-elected re in Vermont based on the fact we know who they are. And we have elected Republicans and Democrats and Independents and we've had in Republicans who've told, declared that the Republican Party has left them like uh, Jeffords did. So we, we have a great deal of autonomy from the system that almost none of the rest of the national politicians have. And I understand how that system works. I mean, I've been down there and it's not any fundamentally, well, it is different from the, the British system is run in another subtly different way. We have permanent secretaries and they manage the politicians <laughs> to, to maintain the status quo. Um, but I don't have simple solutions. All the things that you are suggesting and your interest, this is such a huge field that my advice to people is to look at the part that attracts you and push. Mm. And remember that slogan from, I think it was, uh, I've forgotten that, Mid Boggs. Uh, someone can... Uh, Grace that? Boggs. No, she's a 90-year-old... Yeah. Uh, from Detroit. From Detroit, yeah. yes. We are the leaders we have been waiting for. Mm -hmm. she's, no, that's, that was Bob. At least I, Margaret Mead has a similar one. I mean, it's no good just waiting around. You've got, it, it's difficult even for you within your busy lives to find time to push on the system, to change your own lives, to change the places you work. Just feel it, take it lightly and keep doing it. Um, because if you're politically inclined, like this group is, Tim, then yes, push on these divestment issues. But don't, I don't waste my time myself trying to get the rest of the politicians in Washington to follow. From my perspective, they are dooming themselves. They are certainly a huge drag, but this is where the diversity of the global system and the fact that if you are foolish enough to ignore some of these big issues, you're going to lose. I mean, Virginia passed legislation that the coastal planning could not uh, con consider sea level rise more than what happened in the last century because it would be bad for property values. Well, they had to re reject that bill, but they're postponing, allowing the town plans to take account of predicted sea level this century. They may be, they think it's good for their property values, but those people aren't going to be fooled with the next few tidal surges that come up the coast. Um, they, that kind of strategy is like building back in floodplains and waiting for another storm to come around and expecting someone to bail you out. Um, it, tell, clearly explain what is happening and why we need change here and push where you can. Look as Meadows, Lanella Meadows, look for leverage points everywhere. They're always a surprise when you find one. You don't know where the system is going to give. Um, so your, your main focus is, is slowing down the degradation through the waste stream. Well, is that really that's one of my focuses. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a climate researcher. My main focus in life is trying to understand what's happening to the climate system. Okay. But the big strategic issue for humanity is to stop dumping all our waste streams. And all the implications of that back through the industrial society. Because that's the thing, primary cause of most of our problems here. And just the way we started. Didn't matter when we pushed back the Native Americans and pushed everyone, we had the infinite quest uh, for the United States. Didn't matter. Yeah. But of course it matters. There's nowhere for it to go. The oceans are filling up with junk of all sorts. The CO2 is dissolving in the atmosphere. The ocean chemistry, the, the acidity is changing. And all of life in this oceans is going to change by the end of the century as a result of that. The oceans will look after themselves, but we aren't going to like it. The oceans have actually kept all the building blocks of life going for two billion years without our help. Through all sorts of catastrophic changes on this planet. And they will go on doing that. But we won't like it because we will lose some of the things that we treasure from 
or our local industries here and there. My strategy on the mitigation side is slow this process down, give the Earth time to adapt, give us time to adapt. The more we can slow it down, the easier, and the sooner we do it, the easier it's going to be downstream this century. And you've em emphasized doing it on a local level, and right? because the educational process is the same everywhere. Right. If you can't do it here locally, then <laughs> how can it? I'll give you a story on this. Okay. Um, I'm at Burn Burton, which is a private Manchester school, you know it. Okay, it's an evening talk, and I've got the environmental high school seniors in the back row, and transition Manchester in the front row, and then, you know, they're mostly gray haired right? The people in the front row and the kids in the back row. The people in the front row tell me, I should be telling the kids in the back row what they have to do. Oh. And I kept turning back to the people in the front row saying, well, it's your job to do these things, set up the infrastructure, and hand it to these high school students, or students, or well, ones left here, um, in 10 years when they're in a position to pick it up. You can't expect them to do what you haven't been able to do, and you're still talking about, well, you're doing some things, and you're all doing some things, but the scope, you all know that the scope of the transformation we're dealing with is actually bigger, and it needs a more integrated response across our society. Well, the, the, the town of Seymour, is, or people in the town of Seymour, uh, which is one of the third cleanest lakes in the state of Vermont, are suing the state of Vermont for not protecting the lake. This is Champlain? No, this no. is Lake Seymour. Lake Seymour. Third, Seymour. Yeah, it's like one, it's in the top Seymour. three cleanest lakes in the state. For not and, protecting the lake, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think it's great. I, I grew up on Lake Champlain and I, my wife and I have this argument, we both grew up on it, but I won't swim in Lake Champlain anymore. It's too dirty for me. I, I won't do it. It's sad, but I, I, I swim in that lake since I was a little kid. Well, there are many, many waters in the world you wouldn't want to swim oh, in. Oh, right, this point. right, so, yeah. You wanted to say something. Yes, um, you had said something earlier about, um, you know, people don't want to give up. We're all used to, you know, having hot water, taking a uh, warm shower, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and no one wants to give up their cars and stuff like that. So, is there not? I mean, the only thing I think is going to be the, the equalizer is when there's a huge economic collapse, and there's going to be wars, and I mean, it's just going to come at us from so many angles. Well, we just went through a big economic collapse. Yeah. The global no, emissions no. of CO2 dropped by 3 4% for one year. Yeah. We actually needed to have them drop by that 3 or 4% for the next 30 years. It wasn't enough of them. And everybody <gasps> said, we've got to get back on a growth economy as soon as we possibly can. And we succeeded. Right. That's a mistake. Well, it's, it's, yes, it's a mistake. So how can we go about... It's no good just waiting for an economic collapse and warfare among all our tribal groups or among our nations. If we aren't willing to ask, how can we make the transition now? You all know the motto of the Transition Town Movement? The Transition Town Movement. Do you know its motto? No. Cheerful. Cheerful and hopeful. It went something like this. Very deep. Rob Hopkins, very deep thinker. You should read up on his background. Um, We've had a whole lot of fun on the energy path up. Let's have a whole lot of fun on the dis energy descent path and create the kind of communities we've always wanted. Right? Rather than wait for the collapse that might do it for us because we've clung on to the way we always did it. And here's a, another little hint. I, my attitude, and this is speaking to your generation, is you are not as lost in the past as the older generations are. And you should consciously use that. Realize that your job is not to adopt. You have to learn from everything you are being taught, but realize it's all totally inadequate for <laughs> what we have to face. And not be vested in entirely in getting into the ways of the past. Your job is to help create a new future and drag along some of the older generations with you. Yes. Yeah. Well, in the spirit of that, I think the divestment movement is one of the more mm -hmm. powerful ways that we can weaken the fossil fuel sector. It really is naming, calling out, you know, the, the 200 biggest yes. carbon producers who are using their political power to block 
choices. Mm -hmm. And I think so. I think that the it, community should follow the lead of students, you know. And I think there's now this little focus of town meetings and and uh, pension funds. And there's a website that went up today called Divest invest.org, which is individuals mm -hmm. can pledge, but they can also say I'm an alumni of SIT or I'm an alumni of such and such to aggregate mm -hmm. political power. So I think that, and that is a movement that's led by young people who mm -hmm. are stepping up and putting huge energy in. So I think whatever we can do to support yes. campus efforts. Well, I've said nothing about the financial system yeah. and its issues and corruption and problems and debt structure, but it's a huge issue. And that's some <coughs> people need to think about that one too, because we are now in a position to crowdsource things outside the financial system, yeah. and that's going on. And we know where investment is working because people are following carefully whether the Price, the share prices of the oil companies have not shown any decline because no one has, um, whatever the jargon would be, devalued their thirty trillion dollars worth of assets. Right. Well, it's Even an though asset bubble, so we did another bubble. Right. But so that we'll we, we'll see if we see yeah. any mark, we see a shift in that, we'll know we are succeeding in that. This means that the financial community is starting to realize, this is what we want them to do, that we cannot burn all the fossil fuels without catastrophic damage. I think there's increasing evidence that the financial community is aware of that and, and are afraid that they're going to be stuck with investments because the yeah. oil will not come out of the ground. Um, I think there's a number of things that have happened in the last six months alone that show that investors are seriously aware that maybe uh, fossil fuels is not the, uh, the thing to invest in. And that is why I, I agree with what Chuck said a moment ago. I think divestment is, a, is an example of what I was asking about a moment ago of how to create a political movement that begins to change things. There you are dealing with not the uh, um, Choir, such as in this room right now, you're dealing with people who are dealing with looking at their uh, invest their portfolios and saying, "Is this where I want? Is this what I want to be investing in? Uh, and will this realize the money I want?" I would also push the other side, and I think solar yeah. is a huge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a no-brainer investment at the moment, yeah. Yeah. and we should be recapturing that for Vermont rather than just letting it be run for us by the rest of the world. Well, the divest 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 movement does divest talk divest about divest, divest invest, yes. Yeah. yes. But, and to this point of solar, we can each personally become as net zero using energy as possible. Yep. And I think I've done it, regard, but not with transportation. And if clear. each of us would do that, we'd have a big impact Manufacturing is, is got the biggest lever of all. And I'm wondering what political measures or you we know, need to get behind the First Nations people in order to stop Harper if we don't close down the tar sands. And, and Harper, Harper has no intention to do that. But I say, well, build your damn pipeline due west. Go through your own provinces. Oh, they tried to do that. Yeah. They cool. They've already said no. They really? Yeah. 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 But South Portland did vote to reverse the um, the line. So that's not that's not good. Thing. It's going to come down to our refineries. So um, why don't we? I'd like to thank Dr. Benson for what yeah. I think. giving us this great presentation. Thank you, Alan. Well, I cheer you on. Thank you. <laughs> All of us together. All of us are in this together.